All right. Hello, everyone, and welcome to our student-centered pedagogy and course transformation at scale, facilitating faculty agency and student motivation to impact institutional change webinar. My name is Patty Webb, and I am the marketing manager for Stylus Publishing. Stylus webinars bring you direct access to our authors and their latest titles. Today, I'm happy to introduce Chantal Levesque Bristol, author of Student Centered Pedagogy and Course Transformation at Scale. Chantal is the Executive Director of, Center, of the Center of Inst Instructional Excellence and Professor of Educational Psychology at Purdue University. She received her doctorate in social psychology from the University of Ottawa. Her primary areas of interest are teaching and learning, motivation, educational psychology, faculty development, and institutional change. She is the principal investigator on a first in the world grant from the Department of Education. In this webinar, we will discuss impact, instruction matters, Purdue academic course transformation, a professional development program, as well as self-determination theory, the motivational theory underlying it. We will cover the structure and components of this program based around the vibrant faculty learning community, as well as the highlights uh, the highlighted importance and implications of the motivational theoretical framework for professional development, faculty agency, student engagement, motivation, and learning and institutional change. Welcome and thank you all for joining us today. Thank you so much, Patty. Um, well, I'll get started with, uh, I mean, since you had the introduction already, this was wonderful. Thank you so much. I'd like to get a sense of who's in the room today. I see from the chat as you're introducing yourself, uh, some familiar names. Um, but as uh, you're typing, just let me know a little bit, what is your primary role, right? Um, are you a faculty developer, um, a faculty, uh, maybe a student? And as you're uh, mentioning this in the chat, I will uh, go ahead and give you a little bit of context for the book and also how I approach uh, structuring this webinar. So uh, yes, you know, IMPACT program, which is our large course transformation program here at Purdue University is definitely uh, a focus of the book. It's part of the story in the book. And I will go over today some of the structure and component of IMPACT. But what I would really like to emphasize is the motivational framework of self-determination theory that is really underlying impact and all of the professional development and how we've approached it. Um, and, and really think about the importance and implication of this motivational framework for student motivation, uh, professional development, uh, faculty agency and institutional change, uh, which is really the, the innovation. And we'll, we'll, we'll dig into this a bit more. Okay, so let's see. I see some answers uh, coming in to the chat. Um, instructor, staff member, uh, member of teaching excellence, perfect. Instructor, institutional, cons institutional consultant researcher, working on new programs. Okay, great. So, um, this is wonderful. So a great mix, and and I and I love the variety that that we have here, and, and and really the principles in the book are useful and applicable whatever your role is at the institution. So I'm hoping we can engage in a conversation about this, and you can see how it can apply uh, to your work. Uh, also in the chat, if you want to to put in uh, how many are familiar with self determination theory, that's going to give me an idea. So maybe just a yes or a no, so I get a sense of how many people have heard about it or are familiar with it. Okay. Um, so I'm gonna give you a little bit of a, a timeline. So we're going back over 10 years ago now in 2011, where the program launched. And very quickly into uh, the program, we adopted the semester long faculty learning uh, model. So that was adopted at the beginning. It did not change. It was really a constant. It's been a constant throughout and it's worked really well. Uh, however, what's different is that initially the model, uh, the redesign model impact was based into the National Center for Academic Transformation model NCAT. It was a very popular model of at the time, very a popular redesign model. And actually, I was not at Purdue at 2011 when we began IMPACT. And at my former institution, we were using the NCAT model to work on some course transformation. 
And what I immediately notice, uh, my background is a social psychologist, I research motivation, is that the model was very constraining with specific targets to achieve, both in terms of improvement of student success and, uh, and graduation rate, and also um, reducing cost of instruction and having to select a particular redesign type and a particular technology uh, to introduce. So you'll understand why I'm framing it this way, because as I'm going over uh, the motivational theory, you'll see why I'm saying that the NCAP model uh, was constraining and limiting uh, as a redesign uh, model. So I'm saying I'm seeing some yes, quite familiar. Yes, no, I have a couple of no. Yeah, okay, just a couple of no. So I think that's going to be good, but that gives me a sense of uh, how in, in depth to, to go into. And of course, I'm uh, describing it uh, much more uh, in the book. So uh, to give you a bit more context of when we started IMPACT, uh, back in 2011, Academically Adrift had just been published by Araman Roska. And uh, using data from the Collegiate Learning Assessment, the CLA, they were reporting that almost half of the undergraduate student showed no significant improvement in critical thinking or problem solving uh, skills. And uh, Derek Bach, with our underachieving colleges, uh, was talking about how our students were adrift and our colleges were not really meeting um, the needs of, of students. Now, this was back in 2011, but if you've been looking at the headlines in the Chronicle of Higher Education and reading some of the articles, you see that we're very much in the same place today, uh, where uh, and here's some quotes from um, uh, the Chronicle of Higher Education that among all Americans, the proportion who believe that higher ed is leading our country in a positive direction has dropped by 14%. And there is a uh, rising cost uh, is a concern. And oops, and then there's also this uh, book that's been recently published, uh, which talks about how higher ed is a key source of modern day resentment. So in that context, it's uh, very interesting to be thinking about innovation, right? So what we were really thinking about back in 2011 when impact started is very much on our minds today. What is the innovation? Um, what is the change? that higher education needs to, to be making um, and, and what, what, will be, what will be the solution, right? What is the innovation? And what I wanna the, really emphasize here and I really tried to highlight in the book is that it's not about a technique or a certain redesign model or a technology. It's really about people. Uh, it's a humanistic innovation. It's about meeting people basic psychological needs and that's really where the motivational theory comes in. Uh, my hypothesis when I really came to Purdue in 2012 and um, started with the IMPACT program is that a close adherence to, adherence to a model like the NCAT model where you have to select a certain redesign type and then you have to follow very strict guidelines uh, and, and really focus on reduction of cost and reduction of DFW rate can be perceived very controlling and limiting and really discourage faculty fellows creativity and really engagement with the process of their redesign. What it really does is that it's limiting faculty agency. Uh, and that's really an important uh, part of the motivational uh, framework. And we saw this very early actually in our own interviews of faculty in the impact program when we were uh, following much more the impact model where they were telling us that they really felt con constrained and a lack of flexibility. And one of our lofty goal was to really foster culture change. And without providing this faculty agency, we were not gonna be able to do that. We were not gonna be able to, to scale. Uh, so just to, again, put it on the timeline, the motivational theory was introduced in 2013. And it allowed us to grow the program from its beginning of 12 uh, pilot courses uh, to 60 courses annually and what we, we have today. But really the important piece, although this sounds maybe, oh, this is a huge uh, increase. We can't do that on our campus. Uh, really, it, it happened because of the introduction of the motivational framework. So let me give you a little bit of an overview about self-determination theory. 
Uh, it proposes the existence of three basic psychological needs, autonomy, competence, and relatedness. And that's really where the innovation uh, comes in. So uh, a bit more about autonomy, right? Autonomy is about choices, uh, options, uh, volition, and agency. It's really not about doing whatever you want to do or uh, a free for all or chaos, right? That's not in this sense of autonomy. And uh, we'll, we'll talk about autonomy, choices, options within the structure. And I'll come back to structure in the, in the next slide. Um, but it's really about providing um, ownership of the faculty to the faculty of their redesign. And also when they're teaching their students and transforming their courses, giving some choice and options to the students as well. So in the learning community, how we do this in, in impact um, is that we really use a process of being clear, right? We're coming alongside the faculty, really trying to understand where they're from, um, where they're coming from and what they want to do with their redesign. What are their redesign goals? What are their learning outcomes? We ask a lot of questions and we support instructor in their pedagogical development by providing options and really understanding um, their redesign goal. We listen very actively and then we propose appropriate solution that will work for the instructors and help them meet their goals. Competence um, is very understood in higher education, right? So it's the development of mastery and skills, but this is really where the structure comes in. Um, structure is important to create an environment that is autonomy supported, especially in higher education. The instructor will have a content area for the course. They have a body of knowledge that they want the students to be able to master. So that body of knowledge gives structure gives a, a, a goal that you can be very specific about in terms of what is it that you want the students to be able to know, to be able to do and accomplish. So again, autonomy in autonomy supportive environments is not about you know free for all or doing whatever you want. It's really those choices and, and options within that structure that only the instructor as an expert really can, can determine. And here as consultant, we are there to help them uh, identify what is that structure and what kind of choices they can give to students within uh, that structure. In the FLC, when we provide uh, structure to the faculty and we meet their needs for competence, uh, we use actually um, pre-work every week that they do before they come to the faculty learning community so that we can guide uh, their progress or clarifying uh, their goals and their learning outcomes. Relatedness is uh, the third need. And often we forget about relatedness, especially in higher education. Uh, but to foster autonomy supportive environments and engagement, relatedness is, is really important and is crucial because we are humans relating to other humans, other individuals. So relatedness is about belonging, sense of caring for one and being cared for uh, by others, and a sense of connectedness. And although it sounds very uh, touchy and feely, you'll see I have some quotes later in the, the webinar where our uh, faculty are actually mentioning this as important in their redesign. Now, when the basic psychological needs are met, uh, what happens is there's a shift in motivation, uh, in the continuum of motivation toward more self-determined forms of motivation. So on the right side, which include you know, identification, integration, and intrinsic motivation. Now, we often hear the distinction between intrinsic versus extrinsic motivation, and that's not enough for the work that we do, right? Because intrinsic motivation is a very specific type of motivation where behaviors are engaged in solely because they bring satisfaction and enjoyment uh, for the activity. So it's not a means to an end. So intrinsic motivation is a very special type of motivation, but we don't see it often in higher education, right? We don't see it often in education. How often do we see students that are able to engage in behaviors uh, related to their coursework that would just be out of joy and satisfaction. We rarely engage in behaviors that are just for joy and satisfaction. But one of the very important contribution of self-determination theory is that 
there are four types of extrinsic motivation that are proposed and two of them that are self-determined, uh, which are identification and integration. So although those behaviors are then done as a means to an end to accomplish a goal, uh, to complete the class, there could be a, a self-determined motivation uh, behind that extrinsic motivation. And that's really where identification comes from, where the students become to understand the personal importance and the value of, of the activity and they're able to endorse their goals. Uh, and we do the same thing in the faculty learning community. We really work with the faculty by, uh, you know, when we listen to them, when we engage in, in questioning and in the inquiry process, it really helps the faculty understand the value of what they're doing and really understand uh, why they're approaching their redesign uh, in a certain way. Um, so we move away, right, from a focus on external rewards, punishment, compliance, and reactance, which is where external regulation, extrinsic motivation, the, the, the uh, what we think of the prototype of extrinsic motivation is located. And when we focus in our redesign uh, mostly on grades, the outcomes, reduction of uh, DFW rates, for example, we locate ourselves in, in that type of motivation uh, and that uh, prevents this fostering of creativity um, that we want to see. Okay, so I'm going to stop here for a little bit. I've talked a lot and I don't see uh, more questions in the chat, but let's take a pause to see if you have some reaction. Uh, you can put them in the chat. Uh, I think we can use a raise hand function as well, but the chat might work. And here's a prompt if you don't have a question that, that comes to mind. Um, can you think of examples of controlling environments in education? Uh, that as we're going through this presentation, you're, you're thinking about. And then the flip side, how or where could we foster more autonomy support? I'll give you a little bit of time to just put your thoughts in the chat. Or there's the Q&A as well, I don't. All right, so I don't see if people are typing. I'll give it a little bit more time, but that's okay. We can continue and then, oh, here they come. The rigid course or curriculum requirement programs that attempt to prepare students for the MCAT where they feel like they have choice and how they approach course redesign. Yes, we see that. Classrooms tend to be more controlling environments, but I would like to change that. Great penalties for tardiness, missing class is a super common mode of control. Yes, uh, only one way of answering questions, curving grades. And I think Susan, you're starting to sort of flip it, right? How could we provide more choices and options where well, we can provide choice in terms of film choice, readings, final project, uh, coming from a community college, we're regulated to death, what classes will transfer to a four year, what our syllabi must look like. So I written me called in for review, just goes on and on. Definitely stifles professors' ability to innovate at this level. So what are some strategies that we could use to foster more autonomy in those situations? I know reliance on exam is another one. One thing that I have not talked about that might be helpful here in terms of those very difficult situations where uh, there's a high level of control and you feel as an instructor or a developer, you don't have a whole lot of way of changing this, right? It could be accreditation. We hear that at our institution. Right, is that to provide a rationale, right? Why are we having this structure? And to asking those questions as well. 
why are we having that 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 structure? Why do we need to um, have uh, the, these syllabus that are very uh, astringent, right? Or where do, why do we have to follow this model? And where is the freedom and the agency? Like, how can I change it? How can I improve it? Might be helpful, but providing a rationale uh, when uh, autonomy support is not possible or choices are limited is really a good way to engage in a conversation uh, with faculty and students uh, that allow at least an understanding of why are we having those controls. And sometimes asking the questions then highlight that those controls are not necessary, right? Check a little bit. Requiring all sections of the course to be the same. Yes, that's uh, one that we hear often. And here, right, there could be, let's say, a structure where certain parts of the course or the structure of the course or maybe the topics covered need to be the same, but then maybe the way in which you approach the topics or the context in which you can present those topics or the types of readings that you can bring then would be a choice uh, that you could then have, right? So the common objectives, right? Same common objectives, but maybe the way in which you achieve those objectives uh, could, could change. Okay, I really like this. So keep keep bringing those ideas uh, as to how we could bring more autonomy support, and I'll go uh, to the next uh, section. Uh, but but keep thinking and, and chatting away. I like that. It's good. Okay, so the next section of um, the book, I really focus, and now I, I get more into chapter four of the book, the middle section. I really focus on the structure of impact. Um, and also how the motivational principle has uh, have changed our approach toward impact and professional development uh, in general. So with the introduction of the motivational framework, impact's aim uh, is to support instructors in enhancing their pedagogical practices in order to create student-centered, autonomy-supportive, and inclusive learning environments to foster student success within what they can, within their structure. And sometimes the structure is very tight, right? There's not a whole lot of choice, but finding those points where we can support an instructor to create these environments where they can bring choice to their practice, right? So we, we help faculty think about where are the choice points for you uh, and how can you provide more choices and uh, autonomy for your students. Because that's, as you mentioned in the chat, you feel it, right? Those controlling environments do not allow you the creativity, uh, the flexibility uh, to create and be excited about uh, your, your courses. Um, the adoption of the theoretical framework of self-determination theory and keeping this in mind constantly as we do our work, even when we face those very challenging environments that you're, you're bringing up, um, have really helped us think about the evolution of impact, also our approach toward faculty development, and also how we scaled, uh, we're able to scale course redesign. And I want to talk about uh, three important factors, uh, how we provided autonomy in selecting the redesign elements, um, how the focus is now on professional development, and uh, the importance of the creation of this vibrant learning community. So I'll start with providing some autonomy in selecting the redesign element. Um, so in addressing the instructor's need for autonomy and really placing the instructor at the center of this process, uh, our process became, became one of inquiry, and I've already mentioned that. And uh, faculty fellows are no longer pushed toward a specific model or technology. Um, they have uh, the liberty to really pick and choose how they want to uh, transform their course, what they want to do uh, to engage um, the students. So we really help them think about the strategies uh, that they can uh, bring forward. So if a faculty is interested in using a technology, we really think about the way in which that technology is fostering student engagement and fostering uh, satisfaction of the needs. For example, you could use a student response system 
like the clicker, right? It's a technology, but let's not use a clicker uh, to record attendance, for example, right? Because that would be um, not a very good use of the technology that could appear you know, controlling. That's when students get uh, another student's clicker to record attendance when they're not there, right? So it, it, it gets you into this place of this extrinsic motivation of uh, I'm going to do it just because I want to have the points, as opposed to using the technology as a way to engage with questions that are well-timed throughout uh, the presentation of the course. Uh, so rather, instead of focusing on a specific redesign model or type or technology or any uh, strategy uh, for that matter, we really encourage faculty to clarify for themselves their redesign goals and their learning outcomes and select activities and assessment practices that will meet basic psychological needs, right? So we really think here about what are your assessment doing? What is the mix of assessment that you want, formative uh, and summative? And how can you uh, really use alternative forms of assessment uh, that would support basic psychological needs and really help all students succeed, right? Not just the ones that look like you, not just the ones that are the high performer that would do really well with or without you, but all students. But how can you present your material, uh, your activities, and how can you assess in a way that provides options and choices for students to demonstrate uh, their knowledge? So we really foster faculty's autonomy and agency in the faculty learning community. And it's, it's really a model uh, for student-centered ped pedagogy. So we model, um, our workshops are modeled in a way that we would like them to then turn around and so pay it forward, a model for um, their students. Uh, and, and that's really what a close adherence to any sort of a very restricted environment or a type of redesign model like NCAT, uh, that's where it becomes, um, uh, you know, not optimal. Okay. The, the, oh, the focus also on self-determination theory allowed us to focus on professional development. So really shifting from a focus on let's redesign this course and let's build this course to professional development, right? So it becomes less about the course and it becomes about the growth and the development of the faculty and instructors that we work with. We encourage applications of their teaching and learning principles in new context. And uh, this fosters changes in their practices and transfer knowledge to other courses that they have taught that we call the influence course. And this happens you know, naturally, as we uh, focus more on professional development, is that we were giving the tools to the faculty to be able to not only redesign the courses that they were, the course that they were bringing to impact, because they focus on the course as, a, as, as an example, as a way to practice, uh, but it fostered the, the application of those principles to other courses that they, they were teaching, right? Because we were working with faculty to empower them uh, and, and change their practices. The learning community is extremely important. And originally, when we began IMPACT, we essentially had a one-to-one -one ratio, one faculty to one support team member. And this worked when we had a very small uh, program, very small cohort. But as we were asked to grow, when IMPACT became a, a Purdue move part of the strategic plan, we could not do that any longer. But uh, self-determination theory really provided the answer, right? So we formed groups of faculty working together with two to three support team members. So now we have six to eight um, uh, people sitting at a table in a team working together, building community, really generating this sense of community and fostering relatedness by having fellows work together. And one of our approach, again, through this scholarly process is to ask questions, right? So if a faculty is really struggling with something in their course, we're not coming right out and say, oh, I got the answer. I got the answer. We guide, we ask more questions, we try to really understand uh, where the faculty are coming from. And then other faculty in the team start to help each other, right? So we really foster this connection between um, the faculty fellows 
uh, amongst themselves and also the fellows with the support team member in this uh, really vibrant community, community. In any semester, we can have up to 30 fellows per semester and almost as, as many um, support team members. So in summary of this section, right, the building blocks of an autonomy supportive learning community learn through professional development is to really support others initiative, choice and agency. Uh, understanding others perspectives, sometimes you cannot provide choices and option immediately. So now we need to understand where are you coming from? Where's your starting point? Uh, where are your frustration? Um, what are your goals? And then provide informational feedback and continue this process of inquiry uh, in, in a very collaborative way when we work with the faculty and, and hoping that they can then do the same thing with their, their students. And this is actually happening. We'll talk about some of the quotes. Uh, providing autonomy within a structure and providing a sound rationale for that structure. Uh, in this section of the book, I'm actually pulling a quote from Bell Hooks on uh, in her book, Teaching to Transgress. Um, and I think that this is very appropriate for the process that we're going through and what we're trying to engage the faculty in. Uh, she's saying more than ever before in the recent history of this nation, educators are compelled to confront biases that have shaped teaching practices in our society and to create new ways of knowing different strategies for the sharing of knowledge, right? So our role is to really find a way to provide that space, to provide that autonomy within uh, those structures that are you know, very controlling. So we need to find new ways. And that's, that's the hard work and it's hard work and it's difficult, but that's, that's, our, that's the invitation. That's what I uh, invite us to do in, in the book. The structure of the FLC is I just spend a little bit of time um, giving you some of that because that's it, this this will look similar to many of the programs that you have on, on your campus or other course redesign program that you've seen right so we have a 13 session semester long FLC we meet once a week uh, for 75 minutes in the session and then there's some additional meetings that happen outside. I present this because it's part of the structure, but you could do this so many different ways. The structure could be very different. It's something that you could adapt very easily to your campus. That's not the recipe for success. It's not because it's 13 sessions that it's working. We're actually now uh, post COVID and because of the COVID pandemic are experimenting with different versions of impact. And we actually launched a one week version that's working really well. And uh, that is meeting a new need, a new demand. And now we have our full semester FLC that is full. And we also have our one week impact program that is also um, uh, full. Uh, we follow a uh, backward uh, redesign process uh, that is influenced, I like to think, by uh, motivation and self-determination theory. So we begin uh, early on in our session three and four to talk about learning outcomes and objectives, but we first couch it, uh, use the backdrop of self-determination theory and motivation uh, to really uh, open up and, and, and sort of give it context, give context to the work on learning outcomes and objectives uh, and assessment and uh, learning. And actually we, we start our sessions on assessments are first and then we get into the sessions on learning activities but through this visual that I also have in, in the book, and this was actually created by one of our uh, graduate students, uh, Elise Marie Allred. So thank you for letting me uh, use this figure. But I was trying to describe the process as very iterative of working on modifying your learning objectives, clarifying your learning objectives. And then as you're doing this, selecting learning activities and ways to assess those activities that are going to meet the basic psychological needs and foster the success of all students in a very iterative process, right? It's like I, I have this activity, but if I want to assess it in a way that will meet the needs, I may need to change my assessment. I may need to change my activities. Oh, I may need to change my learning objectives. So this process is continual with this back, backdrop of, of motivation. Okay, let me take another pause here. Uh, and see if you have some more questions. Um, I think I can open up the, the Q&A. Oh, here we go. Um, 
I have some questions in the Q&A as well. What was the scale of the work? How many unique instructors, unique course program? Great question, Michael. We're actually, uh, I'm gonna show you a visual of it. So you'll get the sense of the scope and the increase. Uh, if you have other questions also, let's take another five minutes to type some of these in the chat. Maybe not exactly five minutes, I'm looking at the time. Um, what boundaries, incentives, or other impetus to not just reformulate less effective or traditional pedagogies and create innovative and or more effective pedagogy? How do you help faculty evaluate and guide their plans? Um, great question, right? And, and I think this really uh, happens through the process of developing the trust with uh, the faculty fellows. Uh, many of them will come in with um, actually, now that they know more about impact, they kind of know our process. Um, but it's really through the process of questioning, uh, really coming alongside the faculty and uh, really talking about alternative ways, different types of pedagogies, different ways to innovate, uh, but really start to think about outside the box. But it's really through that relationship with uh, the consultant during uh, the FLC. Uh, we have a lot of sections of low pass rate courses that are frankly a wild west free for all. Let's take curious questions. They're kind of a sweet spot that allows faculty autonomy, but includes quality control. So here I think what you're talking about is, is, is autonomy within a structure, but that structure might need to be a bit uh, more uh, constraining. And we actually have some evidence uh, while we are not focusing on grades and reductions of DFW rates, where we actually see changes in those, but it's, it's as a resultant of creating that environment that is autonomy supportive. Um, so I would say that by focusing on uh, the low pass rate, that may not be the starting point where we want to begin. So Victoria, I see in the chat that you're saying wisely constrained. So that seems like that that resonated. So that's good. Okay. Um, influence course, how many is there the loss of fidelity? That's a great question. And uh, actually, I'm going to keep going to show you some of the other slides. And hopefully, have another 10 minutes for uh, questions at the end. But we actually do uh, also um, survey the students in these influence course with the motivational survey. So I'll go to what that um, a student, it's a, it's, a, it's a student perception survey uh, that is validated from self-determination theory. And we have very good uh, results as well, right? So those courses are also perceived by students to be uh, autonomy supportive um, and, and meeting the basic needs. Okay, so let me continue a little bit and give you some, uh, sort of a broad implication uh, of a focus on motivation. Here, I'm gonna get into a little bit of the, the results and some quotes that I would like to share with you from uh, faculty. And that's really the, the third section of, of the book. Uh, faculty change, agency and professional development is where we'd like to start with. I've already touched on this, um, but I wanna give you a, a bit more in terms of what we see in terms of significant changes. And we see this in our uh, survey that we provide to faculty at the end of their uh, involvement with the FLC, but also after they implement the course and then also in some focus group. Um, the faculty are reporting significant change in development of new ideas, skills and perspective, which we would expect from this program but also greater satisfaction toward their teaching practice, right? And, and I really believe that that comes from the motivational framework and the model, right? We, it's not about fixing the course, right? It's about development and growth. And when we approach it this way, the faculty become excited again about their practice. And we hear that a lot. Uh, they develop self-efficacy and confidence for student-centered, autonomy, supportive, and inclusive practices through this hard work that they're doing with their support team members, right? Where they're becoming very vulnerable about what's, what, what can I do? How can I uh, provide autonomy in face of these challenges? Um, they're also seeing changes in pedagogical practices designed to enhance student engagement, 
by meeting basic psychological needs, they become much more comfortable and willing uh, and confident in their ability to meet students' psychological needs. And they understand that it's gonna be hard work and they become more motivated to engage in this hard work of reflection and course design and uh, redesign. Here's a quote that uh, I think speaks to that. I came in with a sort of very big goal of making a really big class more engaging. I feel like self-determination theory helped me drill down to how I would like to do that. And one piece that I think is important is relatedness. I love that quote. <laughs> Sending them out into the world to do certain things and relate with people. And I'm hoping it will make them more excited about what we're learning. Right, so this faculty is talking about the basic needs that we often forget about in higher education relatedness. I think that's that's very powerful. And then also that equity piece and thinking about what kind of policies could I implement in my class to create more equitable outcome. Instead of saying you get one chance to submit this essay and that's it, just being open to that possibility, right? So they're thinking about ways in which they can uh, use assessment in a way that is equitable. Uh, I think one thing that was addressed early that I never thought about before is concerning what assets the students bring to the course. They bring life experiences that are probably related to the subject matter. I never thought about trying to assess and taking that into account. Why I haven't I thought about that or why I haven't I heard anybody else talk about it that way. So very early on when we talk about motivation, we talk about students uh, having assets. Right, so supporting all students and the basic psychological needs of all students, and that really resonated um, with this faculty. Uh, in terms of student engagement and outcomes, I know there is a question in the chat about, uh, can I talk a bit more about the specific variables? Uh, we use a, a validated self-report survey, and actually uh, the question, the survey itself is in um the book and it's it's one of the appendix at the end and what we do is that we use scales variety of scale to measure motivation uh so the the, the types of motivation on the self-determination theory continuum uh, and satisfaction of basic psychological needs and we find high level of self-determined motivation and need satisfaction uh for the course the target course but also the influence courses uh, and we see, and this is where by not focusing on it, we still see uh, the improvement in grades and DFW rates, but we don't focus on this at all. We focus on the redesign of the environment, the creation and environment that is engaging. Um, and this translates into about 500 students that would be not passing otherwise in some large courses. Mindful of the time, but I want to show you this one that talks about what the faculty are seeing in their students. So these are faculty reporting the changes that they see in their students, and they're reporting significant increase in their study habits, uh, their critical thinking skills, their engagement, and their activity in the course. And when they see that, the faculty are then really captivated, right? They get really excited about their practice because they see the change in their students and then they really see the, the power of, of motivation and giving choice and autonomy and providing um, those environments that are autonomy supportive. Um, just a few more and then I'll open it up. That really allowed us to scale uh, and, and work on institutional change because the faculty are seeing the changes and then they become our greatest advocate uh, by fostering uh, faculty agency and providing autonomy and and they're able to 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 bring this into their class we're, we're fostering greater motivation in them it changes their motivational approach uh, and and that really energizes them and then they're talking to their colleagues about what they're doing and they want their colleagues to to come um, to to the, to the practice um, we wouldn't be able to do this without a very large team. Um, so that's important to mention in terms of what we've been able to do in terms of scaling, but we've involved the teaching and learning center, the libraries, teaching and learning technologies, 
uh, institutional research and also uh, upper administration. Um, Michael, you asked about the scale. That's the uh, graph about the scale. So we started with a pilot back in 2011 with only 12 courses. And uh, now almost uh, this actually with this current cohort is at 474 faculty. Uh, and if we count, if we look at the influence course, it's over 2000 courses that have been influenced. It reached all colleges and some colleges have made strong commitments uh, to have all of their instructors uh, participate. I'm gonna just show you a few quotes uh, from actually Gary Bertolini, who was a uh, Dean of Purdue Polytechnic. Um, one of the foundation's high impact practices that they adopted was to convert all of their courses to an active learning format. This was a daunting task that faced our college and the impact program really helped with that. I wanna go to this quote to finish because what he says here is something that I could not have planted even if I wanted to, but he talks about how the results have made a remarkable positive difference in our courses, our faculty and our student learning outcome. Students are more engaged and we believe that our improved first year retention and improved graduation rates are in part because of our adopting the impact way of teaching. The impact program has opened their minds and hearts to recognize that a focus on their teaching will have a direct benefit to their students and their own satisfaction. Um, I can't finish better than, than this in terms of what he's talking about. The impact way of teaching is, is uh, the principle of self-determination theory. And uh, Patrick had a question about, do we have a model framework to guide our interaction with faculty? We really focus, we follow uh, self-determination theory and motivation, uh, theory, and, and that's how we guide and uh, prepare our um, uh, team members to consult with the faculty, and that's what we bring uh, to them. So that's really our guide. So it's not a recipe book in a way that do this, do that, right? We talk about some uh, sort of building blocks, right? Providing choices, providing options, uh, providing a rationale, listening, um, you know, understanding your students, uh, and, and that's really our, our, our model. And that's really how uh, we, we do the FLC and, and, and how we train, I don't know how we use the word train, how we work with our um, team members uh, and we prepare them and they get prepared before they go work with the faculty. Okay. Um, I like this slide. It, you may have heard about the impact program in other venues as well, but <laughs> let's open it up for, I think we have a bit more time, not as much as I want, to, but let's open it up for discussion. I'm gonna stop sharing my screen. Oh, um, for the rest of the time. And then I, the, the webinar is recorded. Somebody's asking, can we have the PowerPoint? Uh, that that's fine if that would be I would be happy to do that through Patty perhaps. So discussion open. What did that resonate with you? Um, do you see places in which this could infuse your program, help uh, scale professional development? Do you see ways in which you could provide uh, faculty some more agency and autonomy? And could, could you see the benefit of that? And the short answer, yes, okay. Did it uh, sort of give, uh, give you more uh, questions and answer, more things to, to think about? And again, I wanna say, it, it, you know, the scale of the impact program is um, unique. And we've been able to, to do this large course transformation, but we started very small. So I wouldn't let the scope of it and the scaling of it um, scare you away from trying those practices because it can be very powerful uh, with starting with a very dedicated core group, which is how we started with our 12 fellows, right? And we used to have to recruit um, for a cohort, and we don't have to do that anymore. The faculty are now um, 
talking about the program and um, we don't have to do recruitment. Okay, let's see, Susan. Yes, we've been considering a teaching and learning certificate and have been debating how structured it should be. These ideas make it clear that providing choice and faculty development is the way to do, yeah, the goal, yeah. So yes, you need to have a, a structure, right? But the structure should not be overpowering your, your workshop, right? Your development approach. Um, if you give too much the answer, right? If it looks like you're coming too much like the expert and this is the only way to do it, and there's no choice and option, it's, it's, it does not meet uh, the basic psychological needs of, of people you work with. It does not foster their agency. And, and um, you, know, you really need to come alongside them and, and guide them uh, in, in this process. What do instructors have to say about their experience of the FLC? What is important to them in the experience? Karen, well, you know, the learning community um, is the one thing that keeps coming up consistently. That the ability to meet together as a group, have that dedicated time, um, comes up time and time again. And then uh, the motivation principles and really thinking about inclusion as well, right? So, so you saw it in the quotes where they were saying, why did I never hear about it this way? Why was it never presented that way? Um, so, so that is something that we, we can feel is the innovation because they're telling us, I, I, I did not know. I, I did not know that I could provide. I, didn't, I was not thinking about assessing in a different way. Um, do you find that you're preaching to the choir with those faculty who participate? Have you had a strong negative reaction from other professors who do not want to participate? Well, the program is voluntary. Uh, we don't force people to participate. Um, it, in the beginning, we started with a core group of dedicated faculty. I would say that in year maybe four or five, we had more of the, um, uh, you know, challenges around the professional development. Um, but really, because we're focusing on the faculty and, and their issues with their courses and, you know, really coming in as colleagues, um, and like I said, right now, we, we don't have any problem recruiting. I mean, we had our challenges uh, through the year, but instead of forcing it, right? So when we had the challenges, we could have become really extremely controlling in our program and tighten up the program and force people to participate. And that was never our approach, right? When we had people that we felt were coming in because they were forced or being punished, to go through the professional development, we would have a conversation with whoever was recommending them to come and say, well, that, that's not what we do. That's not the approach. It's not a punishment. Okay, let's see. We have a couple more minutes, but let me see um, if there's some questions. So does that answer your question, uh, Janice? Uh, and then we did have some colleges like the Purdue Polytechnic Institute who made it a goal to have 100% of their instructor participate. And that's why I think we had those challenges in the beginning, but our conversation with the Dean, our conversation with the faculty that are coming in and really explaining to them what process we're following and it's about growth and development and professional development and it's not punishment for bad teaching um, that that really that really changes the focus, right? It moves us into uh, fostering the needs, which then changes the motivational orientation. Um, how did we get upper administration support? Well, that's a great question. From the beginning, uh, in 2011, with seed money, upper administration was uh, very supportive. I've always been. Uh, supportive of the program. They may have had different ideas about uh, the program, right? So I said that in the beginning, we were heavily focused on the NCAP model and we changed this over time. And I would say that through our work with faculty, through the data that we were collecting um, with our motivational survey and providing evidence for the changes that we were seeing in the faculty, in their motivational orientation, in their practices, in their engagement with the students, what they were reporting about their students and the changes that we were seeing in the students. And 
constantly reporting to the administration helped us make that shift toward uh, the course redesign focus to professional development. But we've always had uh, strong support with faculty uh, administration, upper administration. But it's been a constant dialogue to really explain uh, our philosophy uh, behind the program that is different. Patrick, good question about how do we get faculty to come into the first place? How does it factor into how they are measured and what they are responsible for promotion, tenure, and retention? Um, that's something that I didn't uh, mention, but I had that slide as hidden. We, many of our faculty fellows who go through the impact program will then use their experience and what they're learning and how they're changing their courses in uh, their portfolio for uh, tenure and promotion, especially if they're going up on teaching. Um, but we've seen it uh, enter into their documents uh, when the faculty also apply for our uh, awards at the university, uh, it, it, even our top awards, uh, we see that most of them now have gone through uh, impact and they really talk about this, right? So it's, it's, uh, it's something that they value. Okay, let's see. All right. Oh, and then I apologize now, Ron. We have some people who just won't engage with any. Yeah, Janus, that's, you know, and it's, like I said, you know, 10 years ago, 12 years ago, when we started this, it was um, not what it is now. It, it was it was difficult. Uh, I think there, the team that you're building, so I mentioned the team um, around, you know, the team of librarians, faculty developers from the Center for Instructional Excellence, Teaching and Learning, the administrator, we meet every week. And we've done this since the beginning um, to, to talk about how we can uh, um, promote the program, talk about the program, who do we recruit? I, I think you really need to start with a core group of faculty and let it grow and, and sort of ripple effect. Um, and and it's, it's hard work. And, and it's, it grows slowly at first, but then it, it's sort of like a snowball. Like I said, we don't have to recruit. We have more people than we have spaces for now. Uh, does that help, Janice? Yes, Lauren, uh, faculty have turned their efforts into sort of project. Actually part of our, um, uh, one of our session is actually a session on scholarship of teaching and learning. And uh, we have a team um, of, uh, of people who work with faculty to help them turn their project into solo if they, if they want to. And we have, we definitely have had lots of faculty to do that. Yes, actually I can share a website. I should have put this, but if you go to our impact website, there is a section on scholarship um, that have been uh, published uh, from the program. Oh, Allison, thank you. Citations can be found here. There you go. All right. I think I have them all. Okay, well, I think we're right at time, Patty. So I'm going to turn it back over to you. All right. Thank you so much. This was a great conversation. So much engagement. We love to see it. All right. Thank you to Chantal for sharing her time with us today. And thank you to everyone who tuned in live with us this afternoon on Zoom. If you are interested in ordering student-centered pedagogy and course transformation at scale, use code SCCT20 to get 20% off the book and free shipping from Stylus. I will share the link and code in the chat bar. The webinar video replay will be available next week and shared on all of our Stylus social media feeds. Registrants will also receive a follow-up email with all of the links shared today including the chat log and the slides. Also bookmark our Stylus webinar calendar online to stay in the loop for upcoming webinar events. We are in the process of putting together our spring calendar so that will be made available shortly. And if you have any feedback on this webinar or any requests for future webinars, please feel free to email us directly at stylusinfo at styluspub.com. Thank you again and they have a great afternoon from Stylus.